Hi again, everybody. This is Jamie Allison, and this is the Big Idea, Big Moves podcast. It's the destination for high performers. We talk to people from different genres, different fields of expertise, all people just doing really cool things in their space. So we've talked to CEOs, we talk to entrepreneurs, we talk to athletes, we've talked to scientists, just people that are doing really cool things that we can take bits and pieces out of their story and, and their tips and expertise, and hopefully apply them to our lives as well. Um, I know I have one of those guests today, really excited about... Uh, uh, jumping into that interview. Just before we do that, um, one really cool thing was this weekend, I was able to get some camping in. Um, one of the things that I was able to do is uh, the folks at Athletic Brewing let me take some run wild, um, some of that brew with me this weekend. If you listen at all, you know I'm a big craft brew guy. Um, the cool stu- uh, thing about this is that it's non-alcoholic, so you can be doing all the things you want to do in your life and all that without the guilt of that comes along with having the alcohol and the extra calories and all those fun things too. They have lots of uh, cool summer stuff now too. Uh, I know they have a raspberry sour. They have all the other things that if you do like craft brew that they actually have that as well. So check it out. If you go into our um, uh, Instagram bio, you can see that uh, you can get free shipping through there uh, and a couple of six packs. So go through, take a look, see if it's something that you'd like, but uh, I will tell you that um, I, I think you'll, I think you'll enjoy it if that's the kind of thing you do enjoy. So, um, so jumping into our conversation today, um, this is really cool for me. Um, as you can see, I actually already have a compete everyday shirt. And I was telling Jake just before we came on here that uh, uh, I had this before we had any conversation about coming on the show. So I will say that it's, it's purely, I would have worn it anyway. Um, but Jake Thompson's with us today. He's a performance coach, keynote speaker, chief encouragement officer at Compete Every Day. Uh, and that's a brand that he started back in 2011 um, and did it by selling some t-shirts out of the trunk of his car. I'm sure we'll hear more about that today. Um, he's an author, um, has a Compete Every Day book that uh, you'll be able to take a look at. And he hosts his own podcast as well of the same name. Uh, he works with organizations and individuals, teaching them how to develop accountability, mental resilience, leadership skills to achieve more in their careers and their life in general. So fits really nicely with some of the things that we talk about here um, on Big Idea, Big Move. So first of all, Jake, thanks for taking the time. I know you've been busy and you just kind of flew back in recently, but uh, thanks for taking the time with us today. Excited to be here. I think the only thing we left out of that intro is similar to yourself, a fan of athletic brewing, uh, free wave. I've actually got a little pack of them in the fridge as well, because I'm more of a hazy IPA type guy. So I heard you talking about it. I was like, ah, Got one of those for this afternoon. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing. They I, I, they are great stuff, and, and the guys there are, are pretty awesome too. So um, yeah, definitely. Uh, um, you know, I'm I'm a craft brew guy, and I like the the hazy stuff too. So they they definitely have everything, which is which is cool. Um, you know, we talked a little bit, Jake, uh, at the front end there about um, you have a real multifaceted kind of performance organization now. Um, you know, things don't start out that way. So maybe you can track us back a little bit. Just tell us a bit about your pathway to, to get here. And, and I know, uh, you know we mentioned that uh, things started out of your car. So I know that it didn't start as this big organization you have now. So tell us about it. Yeah. So I grew up laughing, thinking I was going to be the next Jerry Maguire. I always <laughs> loved sports, loved competition. And so what was a better way than to spend your life around it? Spent the end of uh, college, first part of grad school, interning, working in that industry and realized that's not what I want to do. Yeah. It's 2008. The recession was in full effect. I couldn't get a job at all. Uh, I had an MBA in sports business, uh, non-traditional work experience in the sports world. So nobody was really hiring at that time in any industry, much less to someone that kind of resume didn't fit the box. Yep. I started a consulting practice, basic marketing strategy, a little bit of brand strategy, social for groups. Started to get momentum. Incredibly successful was bringing in great money. I was single, live, you know, my early 20s, living in Dallas, but I was incredibly unfulfilled. And something was just lacking with my journey because the way I saw it is I'm accumulating wealth and I'm having fun in terms of going out and traveling, but I'm doing nothing that's going to live beyond my name. I'm bound by my work is stuck to the time I put in and the clients I have, and it's not really doing anything to impact others. And I started exploring this idea of what could I do to really make an impact on someone else's life. And I went back to, you know, one of my biggest regrets was in my early or early twenties, late teens of walking away from a chance to come back from an injury, to go play football. And I allowed fear in in one of its many disguises to get in my head and to talk me out of it. And in the fear of failing of going after the goal, I wanted the fear of my identity being so wrapped up in what I did who was I if I failed, all of that. 
And the decision to walk away instead of chase it had stuck with me. And it wasn't one that I'd ever told anybody about. But I got to this point in my late 20s where I'm looking around at friends and I'm seeing people settle for crappy relationships because they're too scared to go date again. They're settling for managers that may be verbally abusive, careers that are in a dead end because they're scared to look for another opportunity or to do the work to build skills to grow. And it really broke my heart. And I remember thinking like, there's a better way to live than what I, I'm seeing in a lot of people. Mm-hmm. How do I help them start to see themselves differently and, and maybe see their opportunities differently? So I started exploring this idea of what would it look like if someone would wake up every day and strive for greatness in the key areas of their life, their health, their career, their relationships, their faith. What would that look like to someone? What kind of impact would it have on them? Out of that, I keep pulling at the yarn of, of something here. And eventually the message of compete every day starts to resonate with me. I'm a super competitive guy. Uh, I'd started getting back in shape at that time. I was playing basketball six days a week. I started crossfitting a little bit here and there. And just this whole mentality of every day waking up, me against me, how am I going to be better than I was yesterday? And when I started telling people that, it, it started to stick. And you'd hear people tell me different things that if they were to frame it right, they were competing for. I'm striving to be great in this. I'm striving to reach this goal. So I had this cool idea. Friends thought it was a great message, but I had no clue what to do with it. And spent about six months trying things until my best friend was like, dude, try t-shirts. There's a yeah. company out of Boston called Life is Good. They have a stick figure guy. Ironically, the logo's named Jake. And he's like, I think you can try it. And so I, nothing else I had done to that point had worked. And I thought, why not? Put some money into a few boxes of shirts and tanks. The CED Compete Everyday logo that kind of makes me cringe a little bit now. <laughs> but started selling them out of the trunk of my car behind a CrossFit gym in North Dallas just as a side hustle. Yeah. And as I started to see people resonate with the message, the brand really just started to grow for us. Wow. I, and now, I mean, you see that there's a, a really strong connection with those different communities. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting when you say the compete everyday piece and how that started resonating with people. And I, I, I know that you also kind of talk a little bit about, um, you know, if, if you approach something as competing, that that also means that sometimes you're not going to you're going to fail. Um, and, and maybe just talk about that a little bit. Cause I, I yeah. did like that message around, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you're going to win every day, I guess might be something that yeah. is important to know. And, and I think that's really important because the safe route that most people take is I'm going to hundred percent, make sure guarantee that I'm going to get what I want, or I'm not going to do it. And when we do that, we fail to really reach our full potential because we're setting our ceiling so low. We're not going after goals that stretch us. We're not doing things that help us develop as individuals because there's a chance with anything great, anything beyond your comfort zone, you fall short. That's what makes sports so exciting to watch as a fan is you could win, you might not. And there's there's something on the line. Emotionally, you feel connected with your team that there's a chance you could win, there's a chance you could lose. Mm-hmm. Competition at its at its core is establishing your baseline, identifying opportunities where you want to improve, working at them, evaluating how you did, and then repeating the process. So from a very physical sense, if you your goal is to lift 250 pounds and you can lift 200 now, well, 200 is your baseline. Your opportunity, 250. Well, what are you going to do to get there? Well, I'm going to follow an 8 to 12-week training program. My coach put it together. So I'm going to work at that 8 to 12 weeks. In 12 weeks, I'm going to test. I'm going to evaluate. How did I do? Well, now you moved up maybe 215, 220. Oh, you failed at 225. Some people would say, well, you're just a failure. You didn't hit your goal at 250. Or you could say, you're right. I didn't hit my goal at 250 yet. And what I've done is raise my baseline from 200 to 220. So now when I start the process, my baseline is increased. Who I am is better than who I was. I evaluate my opportunities for 250. I work the program again, and then I evaluate again. And maybe I get a little bit closer this time. And so that piece is really you're growing, you're succeeding, you're winning or you're learning really where the gap is. And that learning process of the gap is, is what separates greats over time. Because most times if you win, you walk away, you don't pay any attention, you're proud, you won. You lose, you walk away, you're frustrated, you're angry. But if you can understand like when I fall short of what I'm trying to do and take the time to evaluate, what did I actually do well this time? Where do I need to improve for next time? Where's that gap and how do I close that gap? And then you start that process again, then you're in a continual growth phase, which is 
really what we want because at the very end of it, whether we're talking a career or, or more serious note, a life, you yeah. want to know you did everything to get as close to becoming who you possibly could have been. Because I've heard over and over again, people talk about hell being this idea of seeing a reflection of who you could have become and what your full potential look like. And, and that can haunt people, that idea. And so when I look at competition, it's a daily competition to say, how do I get a little bit better and a little bit closer to what I'm actually capable of instead of a lot of times what I allow society or comfort or other people to talk me into settling for. And Jake, you mentioned that that, um, you know, being able to get incrementally better is important um, to do across the different parts of your life. So, you know, the one thing that uh, some people also find a challenge, um, you know, in talking to, um, you know, I deal a lot with entrepreneurs and, and uh, you know, people in business and things like that, you see so often that they may have that kind of mentality around one piece of the, their life, um, but it's often at the detriment of the other pieces of their life. And that can be athletes, it can be, you know, people working in business, it can be a whole bunch of different things. Um, how do you kind of, uh, how do you resolve that? Like, how do you yeah. start to kind of take a more whole life approach to using that same kind of competitive mentality that you, you take a look at? Yeah. So there's really twofold to that question. The, the first I think is understanding everything in life has a season and treating it as such. There are times a year as a speaker where I'm traveling multiple days a week, every week. And I know like, I can do this for a quarter, maybe, maybe two, but one, I have to communicate with my wife. Like, here's what's coming down the pipeline from a travel standpoint. I'm going to be away from you more than normal. So I'm setting the expectations up front. This is going to take some more time. However, I follow that up and say, but when I'm here, here's what I have planned. We're going to do a date night every week. We're going to take a trip at this point. Like I'm going to plan it and market. Like I'm going to schedule things to invest in us. Because I know my level of, of being able to be there and be active is going to shrink during this period. Fitness size. I'm not training for an Ironman right now or something like that. So I know my fitness is all in a maintained mode. It's not a preparing for it. But when, every time I go into the gym, it's the mentality of, okay, am I showing up to give my best today? Am I willing to challenge myself a little bit more? And when I hear that voice, it's like, hey, you should slow down. Will I keep pushing till the timer's gone? If I was training for an Ironman, well, then the business travel is going to be down because my focus and extra hours is going to be in there and pushing myself in that arena. So the first is understanding everything has a season and, and noticing that and, and obviously communicating that with the key parties. The second is there's always something every single day we can do to develop in areas. And it, and it has to be small. It's no different than in January when we come out of the gate for these New Year's resolutions. And within three weeks, most people have quit. Like 84% of people have given up within the first three weeks. Majority of people either lack a plan or they go way too big out of the gate. It's like you never worked out. So you're trying to do two a days, six days a week. Like you're going to burn out instantly. So the goal is start to identify small. So what I do actually, and I actually put it on my iPad here as a screensaver, is I identify what are my goals for the quarter? You know, what are my kind of key goals for the quarter? And then... Mm -hmm. If I want to achieve that, what's a little thing every single day that would help me be either more of that person or achieve that? So from a sense of, hey, I want to I want to be at this number on the scale and I want to be at this number of body fat. So what does that mean every day? Well, that means I need to make sure I'm drinking my water, I'm moving, working out, running, um, and I'm limiting, hey, how many nights a week I'm going to have an alcoholic beverage. Or in this case, we, like we talked about athletic brewing, I'm going to make sure I substitute one of that because- that's going to impact my sleep, which impacts how I get up and train. So where am I noticing that? From a, a family perspective, if I want to be a more attentive spouse, one of my goals is when my wife gets home from work, because I work from home, my phone goes into a drawer for the first hour. Like, how do I make sure that's out of sight, out of mind? And that I it simply picked up from teaching clients of like, when you get home from work and you're still taking sales calls and texts and your kids are paying attention, if your goal is to be a better parent, well, let's make a specific action point that's going to help you. It's going to be putting that phone in the drawer for the first 30 minutes to an hour to be able to be locked in in that moment. It's a little teeny tiny thing that doing it once, no big deal. You do it every single day, it's going to change that dynamic for you. And so it's really key that we do small bites every single day because I laugh, you eat an elephant the same way you do a donut. It's one bite at a time. 
may take more bites to eat that elephant than it does that donut, but it's still the one bite. And one bite is very attainable for anybody. But we have to identify the baseline. Where do I, what do I want to be better at? Where am I at now? Okay, I want to be a better spouse. What, what's one thing I can do every day for the next month? It's going to make me a better spouse. I want to be a better leader. What's one thing I do every single day? Better mindset. What's one thing I'm listening to every day, reading? Those are the key areas that you just start to stack it. And, and over time, it starts to develop you into that person or develop that habit. There's an app called Everyday Habits, and it's awesome. I absolutely love it. Uh, you can actually see visually scorecards of like how you're doing on it and scores across the way. But I just set little bitty pieces on there. Read 10 pages a day. Work out or run 20 minutes, mobility something. Make sure I'm writing 250 words a day. Make one sales outbound call. Like each of those things by themselves, super easy to do once, very hard to do consistently over time. But if you do those little things consistently competing against yourself, then you're always in that process of growing because the natural inclination is take your foot off the gas. You did it yesterday. You don't have to do it today. Like Success makes us complacent. And so it's that constant chipping away that really helps us develop. And, and so let's say we're at the point where we're starting to be able to do that. We've got a pretty good yeah. goal setting plan ourselves. Um, a lot of people who listen are, uh, are leaders or are in, whether it's formal or informal leadership in, in organizations and things like that. How do, you, how do you help translate some of that to your teams? Or how, does, how do you find that that kind of rolls into how your team performs by how you might be able to kind of change your habits or how you help them with theirs? Yeah, two, there's two pieces to this as well that I love. So yeah. from a, a commitment change standpoint, commitments require two key things. They require a calendar and accountability. If it's not on our calendar, it's not really our commitment. So if we're committed as a leader to spending more time with our team and getting to know them, where is that on our calendar? One of my clients does a, they do a 50 cups of coffee program where their leaders literally every week should be having a 30 minute cup of coffee with someone on the team and getting to know them on a personal level, nothing work related. So they can build that relationship. And then they track notes, learning about that person so that they better understand that dynamic. So that, that is a pure example where it's on your calendar you're committed to it. And then you have the accountability that one, the other party is expecting you. And the leadership team is holding you to that standard as part of your role. So creating accountability and marking it in the calendar is key. That's kind of the first big piece. The second is what are we saying from a verbal standpoint? Because the rewarded behavior is the repeated behavior. So for instance, if we're in sales and all we do is praise the sales team when the sale closes, Mm -hmm. then the sales team only focuses on the outcome versus the daily habits that they need to be doing consistently to be successful. So what are we doing when we're meeting with our sales team to talk about, hey, what were your outbound calls like today? How consistent with, were you with booking and managing new prospects? What were you doing that is 100% in your control that we know helps influence the outcomes we desire? The more we praise those behaviors publicly in front of everybody to the individual, the more we consistently do that, the more they understand the value of things within our control of managing your time, using your calendar, making the calls. And so as a leader, what you say sets that direction. It's no different than a parent in uh, youth sports. Sports psychologists have talked about this in terms of when parents praise the kid for goal scored hits, wins, kids start to associate mom and dad's love with that. But when a parent praises them for how hard you play, hey, I saw you got pulled, but you still stood up and cheered for your teammates or you were coachable on the sidelines and you maintain that, that positive attitude. Even when the team was down, you were trying to rally. Like those things praise, the kid understands that's important. And those are the skills that develop them for life. And so you, you psychologists see this in terms of sports, no different in the workplace. What we praise, what we give the most attention to is what everybody sees as most important. And so we have the awards at the end of the year for the outcome, and we want to celebrate that, but understanding that's the result of the process. And so what are we doing to put an emphasis and focus on the process? utilizing their calendars, utilizing the accountability to tie it all in together. Now, a lot of, whether it's organizations or anything else have been going through, I mean, it's, it's been a tough few years for basically everybody. Um, and, and one of the things that, that 
comes up often is is resilience and and whether that's mental resilience or even just kind of a, a little bit of a physical along with that as well. Um, uh, two parts of the question. First one is, do you see is is resilience something that can be learned or is it pretty innate? Um, and then the other side would be, you know, if, if one of the two of them is, is there, uh, you know, are there things that you can do to help kind of flex that muscle a little bit and, and do it when you don't have to so that you can react when you need to? Um, I'll throw that out there. Big question. Yeah, I 100% I believe it is a built skill, not a born skill. Now, there are individuals because of things that they went through earlier in life. Mm -hmm. seem to build it or have it at a different level, which a lot of people would think, oh, you're just so resilient. But what they fail to see is when they were three, four, five, six, seven, they were in a tougher situation. Their family was always moving. They were always having to adjust to change and challenges. So mm -hmm. there are circumstances that prime that muscle. However, every one of us can build resilience. And in fact, the one thing I've been saying over the last couple of years is as we're coming out of this. And even now we're headed into this recession period. Like yeah. there's challenge after challenge. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of people that have the mentality of, oh man, COVID and the pandemic was terrible. And one day, man, this recession was terrible. Hope that doesn't happen again in my lifetime. Whew. I got knocked on my butt, but I hope I'm okay. You're going to have a very different group of people who say, I was not prepared when COVID hit. I didn't handle it well. This recession totally knocked me off course. What do I need to do now to one, better prepare myself for the future? And two, better prepare my mindset to respond. Because that's really resilience is our ability to bounce back. It's our ability to respond when things don't go according to plan. And that's one of the most important things for me. Because success in life is not about perfect conditions, perfect opportunities, perfect situations. It's how quickly and effectively we can respond to imperfect situations. Sports, perfect example. Guys miss shots, they strike out, they miss passes, tackles, every game. There is misses. But do you allow the one miss to cause you to miss the next two, three, four, five? Or do you allow the one miss to be its own lifetime and you're focused on a fresh slate on the next one? So that first Pete, 100%, those are the things. What I think that we do from a resilience standpoint is we get really good at interviewing ourselves, putting our focus on what's in our control and what do we need to do today? The one example I always go back to is when COVID hit as a speaker, my book of business <laughs> disappeared for the year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in an instant. And I watched it. I had clients asking for money back for events that were canceled. And I remember all the emotions, the frustration, the anger, the fear, not having a clue what was going to happen. But I also remember like in that moment, I've got to focus on what's in my control. And so one afternoon when all of that kind of went down, I took out a sticky note. I wrote down, What's still in my control? What actions I take, what attitude I choose, and what effort I'm going to give. What's one or two things I can do tomorrow to help myself? Wrote them down. That afternoon, went downstairs, ended up having a, a drink. My wife had gotten home from work. We sat down. We just talked. We watched a movie that night. I just tried to unplug. Next morning, woke up. COVID was still there. Still lost a lot of money the day before. What was I going to do? Cool. Let's look at how we modify our business, what we do, how do we help others? And so I shifted my focus away from what I can't control, which is what's happened. That's all of us. We can't control all of these what happens to us, but we always control how we respond to it. And if we get into the habit of asking ourselves, what's the most important thing I can do right now? What's still in my control? It helps us from a resilient standpoint because it pulls our focus away from everything to what's one thing that's going to put me in a better position. And I think that's important for resilience. I think it's key for building grit because we, we lose it when we focus on everything that's down the line. You think about from a grit standpoint, you think about the finish line. If the finish line is going to take you three, four, five years to reach that goal, most people are like, God, that's a long ways. I don't want to put in the work. That's a lot of effort. But if you ask yourself, what's one thing I can do today to put myself in a better position tomorrow? How am I going to be better than I was yesterday? And you do that every single day. Will you get to that point in five years or sooner because you're consistently showing up, taking action on what's in your control instead of being distracted so easily by what's outside of it. And so it all comes down to asking yourself questions. What's in my control? What can I still do? What action step would put me in a better place tomorrow? I can't change what happened, but what's one thing I can do to respond better to it? You start to get better in that process and you become more resilient throughout that process. Now, Jake, you've, you've put together a bunch of 
different streams of what you do, all of those things. And um, do you have, how, how have you done that? Like, are there, are there, do you have specific mentors? Do you kind of, uh, how, uh, do you look to role models? Do you have people that, you know, support you that way? Um, you know, how, how do you personally kind of take knowledge from other people? Yeah. Uh, any and all of the above. I, I think one of the, the, the things that I've learned to develop over the years is read, absorb information and be able to turn around and teach it. And I think part of that is I grew up in a family of teachers, which was incredibly helpful that never realized it would pay off the way it has now. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, you know, when I started compete every day, I was trying to find mentors and coaches and nobody was like, hey, this is how you do this. Because nobody wanted another competitor in the business, at least the people I interacted with. Yeah. And so I was just figuring it out like a, a blind mouse in a maze. And I was making bad decisions. I was wasting money. I was chasing different because I didn't know what I didn't know. And I was just trying stuff. Guy named Chris Brogan came along a couple of years into it. Online guy. If, if you've been in social for years, Chris is an, an OG and he just tweeted out one day, hey, who can I help today? And I responded. And Chris mm -hmm. took 30 minutes and taught me all about affiliate marketing. And then he and I have become buddies. I found when I, when I started looking at, hmm, maybe I want to go speak. And, and I had some clients reach out. I hired a coach. Mm -hmm. Spent more money on that coach than I'd spent on almost anything in my life. I was terrified. But I wanted to make the investment because I saw the opportunity for growth. When I finished with that coach, I hired another coach to teach me the business side. I picked up a mentor. Hey, you've been in this business for years. Here's what I know about you. Here's what you do well. What can I learn from you? Give me, I'm going to ask you specifics. That mentor over the last four to five years has been incredibly instrumental. And, and then I hired her as my business coach because I said, hey, here's where I've gotten. I know I want to get to this next point. I know you've done that. So let me formally hire you so that I'm investing in you as much as you're investing in me. So I do that. I read every day. Uh, even if it's 10 minutes, I'm going to read. And, and I love I love reading fiction as much as anything else. Uh, but I'm going to read 10 to 15 minutes of a business book, whether there's one on my desk uh, around the corner that's uh, email marketing right now that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. And I got on a plane last night. I was like, I'm going to read 10 minutes of this book. And then I'm going to switch to my fiction book that I'm like really all into right now, but I'm going to make sure I get the business and take notes doing that. I'm listening to podcasts and audiobooks. I'm always trying to absorb as well as anytime I'm in a room or a situation with people, I always try to maintain it top of mind. How can I learn from these folks? I, I don't ever want to be in, and I know we talked off air a little bit about the book and stuff. I don't ever want to be the person where I'm the smartest person in the room. Because that means one, I'm in the wrong room because I'm not learning as much as I could be in this room. I need to be in places where I'm going to be challenged. And then secondly, everybody has something to teach you, either something to learn from or something to avoid, uh, an example to avoid. So what am I picking up on? And so anytime I've had a chance to have an interview with somebody or sit in a room with the CEO and talk about their company, I'm always trying to pull questions from them of just little insights to things. I'm like, Ooh, that would be interesting. And maybe later I'll revisit that. So I look at every day, honestly, as a learning experiment of what can I learn? And then most importantly, what can I use to teach somebody else? And so it may be, um, interview I, I hear after a basketball game and I'm like, I love that line. Let me grab it. Let me show somebody else how this applies to business. Maybe it's just a conversation at coffee. And I'm like, here's what I'm seeing. Like, tell me if this is right. What are you seeing here? Okay, cool. How can I teach that to somebody else? It, it's always around that. But I think that goes into part of one, me just growing up around teachers and kind of having that, what I do now, but two, learning from really good people, the importance of it not being about us. It always being about how are we helping others develop and grow. And when you do that, you're always looking for opportunities to help others and grow. And it's no different than when you want a yellow VW bug as a car and you haven't seen one on the road ever, you think, and then you go to the dealership, you buy one, you drive off the lot, and all of a sudden you see 10 driving home. <laughs> Those 10 didn't just appear out of nowhere. Your brain's focused on them now because this is your car. It's recognizing it. Same goes when you start to shift that mindset as a leader, especially of how do I get more people to like me, follow me, buy from me? No, how can I help more people get what they want? And where can I find opportunities to enhance their life, their work, their careers? 
<laughs> I'm totally going to steal your analogy with the bug, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so this, that's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I haven't heard that before, but it's a, it's a great way to think about it because I think everybody does make that connection pretty quickly. Um, one of the things we always do, Jake, is, is with our guests, try to have, you know, two or three kind of, uh, you know, very specific things our, our audience can do. There's been a whole bunch of them here in our conversation already, even just about kind of uh, reading and all of those things. But um, if you were to say, if, if people wanted to kind of take that whole um, compete every day approach, are there a couple of things really quickly that just today, after they listen here, what kind of things they might um, want to do to get the ball rolling on, on being able to take that uh, attitudes towards the day or the week? Yeah. So I'll give you, I'll give you two. Cause I know we got a, a bunch of leaders. I'll give you a personal and a professional. Mm -hmm. So on the personal side, get an old school calendar, put it on your refrigerator, put it on your bathroom mirror. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld, when he started his career, challenged himself to write a joke every day. And every day he'd write a joke, he'd put a big red X on the box. New day, new joke, new X. And he got into a rhythm where after a while, he wasn't even worried or stressing about the joke. He just wanted to keep the streaks going. Like his brain was like, don't mess this up. Don't break the chain, which is the name of an iPhone app that does the same thing. But there's something to putting pen to paper. And so what you want to do is put it on the fridge, pick one habit, one small habit. It could be reading 10 minutes every day. Could be, I'm going to put my phone in the drawer when I get home. So I'm more focused with my kids. Could be an important one. Like don't start your day in email, start your day, figuring out your priorities, like identify what one thing every day, put it on your fridge. And then every day you do it, put a big red X in the box, keep the streak going. Because what happens is when you miss a day, you're going to visually see it. You're not going to be trying to remember it. You're going to visually see where you got off course and you're going to be motivated to get the streak going back in the right direction. It's the idea that unless we're paying attention to the progress we're making, we tend to forget how much progress we've made. If you're not tracking the weights you're lifting in the gym, six months from now, you may not feel like you've made any progress and get any better and you might give up versus like I started with this and now this is where I am. It builds that confidence. So Putting that visual reminder from a personal standpoint, picking one small habit is key. From a leadership standpoint, the one I want to challenge you with that you can do immediately that will change your organization. And I kid you not when I say that. Three questions every leader should be asking their team. The first, everybody knows. What is your role? What do you need to do to be successful? Essentially, this is the person's job description and what they need to do to not get fired. Everybody, every company pretty much knows like what I need to do and how to not get fired. The second level, the second question a leader's got to ask that most companies don't is why is your role important? Like helping an employee understand a team member, understand why the work they do is important to the team's success. This can be something if somebody that answers the phone for you may think they're in just a kind of meaningless role. You have the opportunity to ask them to talk to them, to help them see that you're actually the first person that somebody interacts with our company with. So how you treat them, how you respond, what your demeanor is like actually helps paint the picture for who we are. So you have one of the most important jobs in the company. So that's key because everybody wants to know their work is impactful. Everybody wants to know that what they do matters. So why not teach them? Here's why what you do matters. The third piece, this is the one that only elite companies do. And, and this is the one that every leader should be doing. Getting to know your people and then figuring out what they actually want to do. Where do they want to go with their career? What's their dream job? Why are they with the company? Some people are going to be working for you and working with you because they just want enough money every year to take their kids to Disney. Like that is their big why. Other people say, hey, I want to eventually start my own company or I want to work in this position. I want to get to this level. Once you know that person personally, once you know what they want to do, then your job as a leader, that last piece, is to help them connect the dots between where they are and where they're going. And when you do that, it's going to take a little bit of work on your end. But when you do that, you're going to keep that in person so much more motivated because they're 100% going to understand when I show up every day, when I do the work I do every day, it's helping me get to where I want to go. I'm not just collecting a paycheck. This leader cares about me as a person and helping me achieve my level of success. And so if it's that person answering the phone, they know, hey, you got to answer the phone, kind, courteous, help direct them to the right person. We know the job. Second level, cool. You have one of the most important jobs because you're establishing the brand, the identity of our company with how you react. Third level, hey, you said you want to be in sales one day. You want to be one of the sales teams and not just on the admin side. Awesome. 
every time you pick up the phone, you're trying to build a connection with someone. You're trying to learn what their problem is, how you can help them. That's all sales are building relationships with people, understanding what their needs are, and then helping them find a solution. So every time you answer the phone, you're practicing building rapport that you're going to need to be successful in sales. At that point, that person answering the phone suddenly went from, I just answer the phones to every day I'm training to get to where I want to go. And it changes your organization. So personal side, get a calendar, visually see your progress, building your habits, professional side, Get into those three layers with your team and it will dramatically change not only how motivated and consistent your team shows up, but what your culture can look like, whether you're doing this with the entire company, or whether you have a small division or team within a large organization, it will change how your team members interact with each other and obviously how they start to show up and work. And probably even their perception of you as a leader as well, because it's you, you are an empathetic leader who understands and, and that makes a huge difference in the engagement of your team as well. So, um, so for those people listening, if you, if you didn't write those down, uh, either roll this back when we're done and kind of listen to them again, we'll put them in the show notes, but, um, those are all gold. So make sure that, uh, you get those, um, uh, Jake, if, uh, I mean, obviously this is a, just a snippet of some of the stuff that, um, that you provide, um, what are some of the best ways to, to kind of learn more about you and, and uh, compete every day? And, and then if people want to hear you speak in their organizations and things like that, what are some of the best ways to do that? Thanks so much, Jamie. So my website, jakeathompson.com has all about my keynote and coaching programs that I do with companies all over the country right now. And then if you want to learn about the brand a little bit, you'd like Jamie's shirt right there, competeeveryday.com is our best site. You'll see us on any social media there, but we've got, like you mentioned, the podcast, my book came out a couple of years ago and, and dives into some of the stuff we talked about on a personal side. Um, and then, yeah, on the professional side, my website's the best choice, but Anything we talked about, the questions, the habit tracking and calendar, any of that, uh, if you hear it on the show, drop me an email to jake at competeeveryday.com. Would love to be able to expand upon anything we said um, or just add some value to you as a thank you for listening to us and hanging out with us today. Cool. All right. And if you haven't hit subscribe on the podcast, do it right now because we have great guests just like Jake every week. Um, and uh, again, I know you're a busy guy, Jake. So thanks very much for taking the time. It's been awesome. Lots of really great stuff for our audience. So uh, again, thank you for, for taking the time with us today. Appreciate the opportunity. All right. And we will talk to everybody else again on Big Idea, Big Moves.